We're going to go right away to Atlanta, where prosecutors have charged former Atlanta police officer Garrett Rolfe with 11 counts, including felony murder, for the shooting death of 27-year-old Rayshard Brooks who he shot twice in the back outside a Wendy's restaurant June 12th. This is Fulton County District Attorney Paul Howard announcing the charges Wednesday. These are the 11 charges against Officer Roth. Uh, the first charge is felony murder. This is a uh, the death that is a, as a result of a underlying felony. And in this case, the underlying felony is aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. And the possible sentences for a felony murder conviction would be life, life without parole, or the death penalty. Fulton County District Attorney Paul Howard went on to say a second officer involved in the killing, Devin Brosnan, will be charged with aggravated assault. Because Officer Brosnan has now become a state's witness, he has decided to testify on behalf of the state in this case. Uh, what he has said to us that is within a matter of days, he plans to make a statement regarding the culpability of Officer Roth. Uh, but he indicated that he is not psychologically willing to give that statement to date. Uh, Officer Brosden, however, has admitted that he was, in fact, standing on Mr. Brooks's body immediately after the shooting. On Wednesday, Howard also revealed a photo of Garrett Rolfe kicking Brooks as he lay dying on the ground, saying both officers failed to give Brooks any medical attention for more than two minutes. During the two minutes and 12 seconds, that Officer Rolf actually kicked Mr. Brooks while he laid on the ground, while he was there fighting for his life. From the videotape, we were able to see that the other officer, Officer Brosnan, actually stood on Mr. Brooks's shoulders while he was there struggling for his life. This comes as a number of Atlanta police officers staged a sick out Wednesday night to protest the filing of criminal charges. The Guardian reports Officer Garrett Rolfe was previously accused of covering up a 2015 police shooting, along with two other officers. Rolfe and the other officers reportedly opened fire on a black man named Jackie Jermaine Harris while chasing him for driving a stolen truck. The officers hit Harris once, puncturing his lung, but never reported the shooting. The judge involved called the case a disaster and the wildest case I've seen in my 34 years here, she said. Meanwhile, new video has emerged of Rayshard Brooks speaking in his own words about his struggles with the criminal justice system. The experience of being locked up in prison, he says, left him deep in debt and struggling to pay court fees and restitution, even as employers turned him away due to his criminal record. Brooks spoke in February with the group Reconnect. I just feel like some of the system could, you know, look at us as individuals. We do have lives, you know, where it's just a mistake we made, you know, and, you know, not, not just do us as if we are animals. For more on the charges against the two police officers for the shooting death of Rayshard Brooks and much more, we're joined by Rashad Robinson, president of Color of Change. Welcome back to Democracy Now!, Rashad. So let's start with these charges. The first officer who shot um, Brooks in the back twice, uh, killing him, faces the death penalty. And the second officer, it's a little confusing because uh, the DA said he's now turned a state's witness, but his lawyer insists he hasn't. Um, it now looks like there are images of him standing on the back of Richard Brooks um, as he lay dying. Your response? Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's really um, sort of eerie to hear Richard in his own voice talk about um, not being treated like an animal. And then to see sort of these images and to, um, you know, see the video from the very beginning. I mean, in so many ways, what we're seeing with these charges is a, is a deep sort of recognition of the power of a movement, the power of a movement to push 
and exact consequences. But we have to recognize at the end of the day, we have to raise the floor what's acceptable, and we also have to keep a deep vision for what human rights looks like. And I do think that, you know, in these states that have failed to prosecute police time and time again, have failed to put laws in place to hold police accountable, that instead of calling uh, a tow truck, uh, we call police, are now sort of putting things in place like the death penalty, which um, is one of the most inhumane sort of exercises of, of how we sort of uh, move towards consequences and punishment in this country. And so I think that um, all of this, right, is important in terms of getting justice for the family. And at the same time, we have to continue to keep our eye on all the ways that the system realigns itself, uh, protects itself, and really hear those uh, sort of words of Rayshard Brooks about being treated like an animal and recognize that there are so many others that are continuing to be treated like animals, enemy combatants in their own neighborhoods by police. Uh, Rashad Robinson, could you talk about what you'd like to see happen? You've called for uh, defunding the police. Can you talk about that? And in particular, also, you've spoken about the role of police unions. Um, how do police unions uh, represent some kind of possible obstacle to defunding the police? Yeah. So for the last 20 years in this country, violent crime has basically steadily went down. And at the same time, police budgets have continued to rise, continue to expand. We've militarized police. Um, if you look at communities where there are a lot of police, what you oftentimes also notice is that there's not uh, healthy food, there's not good schools, there's not health care, there's not parks. So we've basically um, sort of put police in, in place of all the things that we know that communities that are whole and safe and healthy actually have. And so to the extent um, that budgets are moral documents, they say what we actually believe, what we care, what our values are. And when we sort of put 50 plus percent of our budgets, 40 plus percent of our budgets into policing in cities and don't put it into all the things that actually um, make communities safe, we are actually saying something about how we value those people. And so we've really talked about what does it look like to invest in communities and divest from policing? What does it look like for um, at that Wendy's where Rashard Brooks dealt with those police? What would it look like to call um, a tow truck? Uh, what would it look like if we don't send someone with a gun when someone passes a bad check or we have ho or we're dealing with homeless or we're dealing with so many other issues where we don't need, don't need to send someone with a gun? And so the point about police unions is really that we do not have an ideas gap. Whether you're for defunding the police and really thinking about the fact that um, police have failed in their fundamental responsibility to keep us safe, and as a result, we have to take away um, so much of their power because they haven't kept our community safe. Whether you believe in that or whether you believe in some sort of reforms that I feel like we've tried and haven't actually measured, I mean, and haven't actually worked, we don't have an ideas gap. We have a power gap. Because on the other side of all of these issues stands the Fraternal Order of Police and police unions, which at every single term stand in the way of any type of change. You know, uh, chokeholds uh, are illegal in New York. They were illegal when Eric Gardner was choked on camera. And the police union can step in and defend it every turn. I was remember going into the White House during the Obama administration, and we would have conversations about uh, reform and, uh, and about, you know, making changes. And I remember at a meeting after Philando Castile, Alton Sterling, and the Dallas police officers were killed, and um, having this meeting where Obama pulled together about 30 folks from uh, around the country, civil rights leaders, law enforcement, mayors, religious leaders. And we got around the table, and we had assigned seats. We had to put our phones out. And so we it was not the specter of even being in the public spotlight. And I remember talking about um, racial profiling. And the head of the Fraternal Order of Police interrupted me and said, all of this talk of racial profiling is new to me. So what I'm trying to say here is it's not that he said, I don't agree with your policies. I think you're asking for too much. What he said was he gaslit us and said racial profiling basically essentially doesn't exist, that we are making claims that doesn't exist. And so when we have politicians who say they, they stand with us, when they say Black Lives Matter, that they're on our side or they want some reforms, um, and then they take money from the police union, <laughs> that means we can't actually trust you. It means that you can't say that you are for uh, reducing guns, for ending gun violence, and take money from the NRA. 
And so we are creating a new litmus test around what does it mean to actually stand with us on these issues. And you can't stand with uh, a group of people who have treated our communities like enemy combatants that have called Tamir Rice a menace and then helped that police officer get a new job someplace else. We have to hold a standard for what does it mean to stand with us. And if you don't stand with us um, as a politician, a political leader, we're going to hold you accountable. The people who undermine progressive prosecutors. That's the headline of an op-ed you just wrote in The New York Times that, what, you wrote this actually a year ago? Well, I started writing it a year ago, and it took forever to get published, because, you know, um, the process of getting something published and the process of uh, actually meeting the, a news hook. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, The New York Times, I first started talking so about it. So I would say that what oh. happened is it got published when the movements rose up, um, uh, and for many yeah. in the corporate <laughs> media, making it relevant. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you you all make you all talk about these issues all the time. But yes, um, having um, a corporate media say, "Oh, now it's time," was important. I mean, one of the things I wrote about in there was exactly this issue around fraternal order police, and and was able to tell the story after talking with a set of DAs about some of the real barriers, the barriers of whether it's um, prisons that lobby against. Uh, the reforms because they don't want to reduce the size or the towns that need and rely on prisons, um, whether it's the judges that don't want their um, um, sort of legacies undermined by prosecutors who are actually looking at a new vision for safety and justice in a country that has 4 percent of the world's population and 25 percent of the world's incarcerated population. Or the story that I told in the op-ed piece about the uh, fraternal order police in Cook County who marched on the first black woman DA, Kim Fox, um, they marched on her with four white nationalist groups, as reported by the Chicago Sun-Times. They marched on her in front of her office. They took pictures of Kim Fox's face, and they rubbed those pictures on their crotch in front of him, in front of her office. And then these police officers, with their badges and their guns, go back into our communities, and we are expected to trust them while they make threats and attacks on a black woman law enforcement official, the um, uh, uh, elected official in the county that the people sent there to actually deliver safety and justice. This is what our communities consistently have to deal with in terms of people who are given authority to kill us um, that have no rules and no respect for us. And that has to change. And the public of all races have to stand up and join us because police have too much control of our lives, and in particular, black people's lives, but all of our lives. And they have failed in their fundamental responsibility and no no industry whatsoever is given the ability to violate so many rules and laws and get away with it. And it's not just the rules that they violate, you know, when they have their badge and their gun on. It's the domestic violence that the union stand with the police officers with when they commit outside of uniform. And it's all of the ways in which these folks are given a different level of pass. We can no longer accept it. People have been killed and people are dying and our communities are not safe as a result.